This episode of Ask the Doctors has been brought to you by Duane County Government. to keep my family and friends safe. I think it's important to wash your hands because it wipes off the germs. When I play with my friends, we stay six feet apart. Keep wearing our masks so we can stay in school. I wear my mask so people don't get sick. I think it's good to wear your mask because it encourages other people to wear their mask. Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Ask the Doctors on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11, WCTV Channel 21, and streaming on Facebook Live. Our doctors in their 42nd week or so, just crazy glue them to the chairs, <laughs> never let them leave. <laughs> Dr. Thomas Huth, Vice President of Medical Affairs at Reed Health, Dr. David Jetmore, Wayne County Health Officer, gentlemen, once again, glad to see you. Very um, glad to be here. Things continue to move as we do. Let's start off with what's new this week. Dr. Jetmore, start Well, I us think off. The, the newest thing by far, Eric, is we're starting to give, uh, we're starting to vaccinate people, which is, a, which is incredible. Uh, we finally made it to that point. Uh, we're um, uh, vaccinating at the uh, old Elder Behrman site, and, which is fantastic for this. So we were able, it's a very large site. We're able to space chairs out. We've got six vaccination points. We've only got two vaccinators working right at present. We're doing, we'll be doing 120 uh, vaccinations a day, which is, um, we could do three, even four times that, that amount, even more. Um, I think the limiting factor is the amount of vaccine. Um, we, uh, we get that from the state. It's allocated from the federal government to the state and from the state to us. Um, and we're always advocating with the state to get more vaccine. And uh, we were getting Monday, they were gonna give us 200 doses for the week and they gave, then they gave us an extra 400. Uh, so um, we'll, uh, and now we're gonna have 600 a week so I think if we continue to advocate, and we can demonstrate that we're getting those vaccines into patients' arms, uh, the state will be very, um, uh, will do as much for us as they can. But again, the, the limiting factor is the amount of vaccine uh, at this point. But our goal is to get every single person in Wayne County vaccinated at one point or another. One of the questions that, that we've gotten a lot is confusion about the registration. There is a one-stop shop for registering for well, the vaccination. The correct? registration site, our shot, is not a good registration. It's not a user-friendly registration site, especially if you're someone in their 80s or 90s um, and not just a mentally with it person like me in their 70s. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's been part of it. It's been a matter of no, it's do you have access to the internet? Can you see it? Can you reach it? And what's the line like to get in? That's exactly right. My wife registered a couple people, a couple of her older friends, and she had to wait about 90 minutes on each each time. There's a number you can call 211 where someone, a human being, will pick up the phone and talk you through this process. But again, that's that. There's so many people wanting to access that number that it gets tied up for long periods of time. Um, I uh, hopefully the the state will hear our complaints and will try to remedy this. One of the things that you can't remedy is if you have one site and it's just it can just be overwhelmed with people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's mm -hmm. pretty hard to, to fix. But I think as this process goes on, it'll get smoother. I, and that, that's true of most uh, things like this. Uh, e already I see the vaccination process getting smoother. Um, 
it's always a good feeling because people are so happy you know that we've we've waited so long for this moment people are so happy to get vaccinated so it makes you feel good i feel like every uh, shot i give i'm potentially you know saving a life uh, so that's that's a great feeling dr hugh well i guess for me this week uh I've been consumed with getting our own uh, vaccination clinic operations readjusted. We're, we'll be starting at the Kuhlman Center on next Tuesday is the, um, is the finalized plan. And you know, the, really the reason for that is because we, although we have been doing vaccinations for several weeks now, since about December the 17th, uh, the, where our, our main vaccination site in our medical office building is rate limited because of the space available for, for people to be observed, you know. The shot doesn't take hardly any time. I mean, it can be literally under a couple minutes, especially if you go in uh, fully prepared, fully registered beforehand. Uh, the real, the bottleneck happens in the observation period afterwards. We have to observe people for at least 15 minutes, and then for that, we've got to be properly distanced and everything else, and so where, where we have run into a bottleneck is in being able to um, just the number of people we can observe at one time. And therefore, having a big open site like the Kuhlman Center, which uh, will be, uh, is much more open and we can be more flexible on how many people we can fit in there, mm -hmm. I think it will, will, we will literally be able to vaccinate as many people as they will send us vaccine for. So it goes back to the, the the issue that Dr. Jetmore noted, which is, you know, they just need to send us more vaccine and we can get more people vaccinated. And, you know, the state is, they're doing the very best they can. And, and you mentioned the struggles with uh, doing the registration process. And I guess I would put it this way. I'm going to paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill's statement about democracy. Uh, and, you know, and the system that we have is the worst possible except for all the others. You know, I, I think Indiana is doing relatively well and actually made a good choice in having a more centralized, just one way to register. I want to compare that to Ohio, where every county has been tasked to provide its own process. And so, the, you know, there's 80-some counties in Ohio, and there are 80-some different ways this is being done. And you, you, if you think our system is confusing, just go try to do it in Ohio. And, um, uh, or I would compare it to say Florida, where I've heard people criticize Indiana's system compared to Florida, you know, because, because in Florida, theoretically, anybody can go, can just walk into a place basically and get vaccinated. Well, I'm here to tell you, my, my uh, 83 year old mother-in-law was forced to wait out in the cold. It was cold that day, 45 degrees. That's very cold for Jacksonville, Florida for six hours from about 6 a.m. on to get her shot, you know, uh, and, and the line was full of people just like that, you know. Should we have 83-year-olds standing outside for six hours in order to get vaccinated? They, you know, I think we've got actually a pretty good system. It's just a matter of loosening up the supply of the vaccine, which, the, which supposedly is going to happen now that they've decided not to reserve uh, vaccine at the federal level and uh, basically take it on a little bit more trust that the future supplies are going to be there to do the second shots and so forth. So um, this week for me has been all about getting ready for using the Kuhlman Center, which I think will be uh, a game changer for us at least. Mm -hmm. And then um, also we've been doing a lot of work in um, getting ready to provide monoclonal antibody therapy to long-term care facility residents. There are still facilities in the area having outbreaks. It's very difficult for them to access monoclonal antibody therapy, uh, typically because you know it's hard to transport them to the to an infusion center that's capable of handling an active COVID patient and providing that service safely. Just the transportation and the uh, the individual patient's needs make it really really challenging. And what we found is that even though long-term care facilities are are uh, uh, disproportionately burdened with the severity of disease and death from their population, uh, only a minority of those individuals, when they get infected, have been able to access this potentially life-saving therapy. So we're going to turn that around 
and uh, and I've been working on a, a toolkit and a system to provide to actually go into facilities to provide the infusion therapy there. And one of the things that that will do is that we'll be able to not only get more people treated, but we'll be able to do it in a more timely fashion. According to the emergency use authorization for the monoclonal antibody products, that that needs to be done within about 10 days of symptom onset. But I think there's more evidence emerging that the earlier in that time frame that you can administer, the better the outcomes. There was a study released this week showing that uh, using antibody-based therapies within three days of symptom onset gets the best outcomes. So uh, we are trying to align ourselves for that. There is a, a facility in the region that uh, is currently experiencing an outbreak that we're going to try to go in and help this afternoon yet. And uh, so I'm very excited about that. I think that will help to, A, save more lives, and B, reduce pressure on hospital resources. So we don't, you know, for the next wave, and I think there will be a next wave, we, we were, will be much less likely to get into the stressors that we had at the, at the end of November at Reed, where we were on the verge of having to house people in makeshift hospital beds in a conference center. Um, so there's that. And then on the national front, you know, all, all eyes have been on what happens with uh, the vaccine programs with the administrations changing. That's more sort of technocratic stuff. Um, but a lot of people are interested in, in the, um, you know, these variants that are coming out. Now there's a bunch of them. You can't even hardly name them anymore. And certainly they've been in the United States for sure. There are many, many states that are identifying these strains. And, uh, but the vaccine makers and um, experts and academic experts are still saying, and I, as I checked just recently yesterday morning, I seem to still be saying that they think that these variants will be, um, or the vaccines will be effective against these variants. So to me, uh, you know, we've had, we've just, we're coming out of or on the downside of the third big wave for this area, and to me, the question is not, you know, what if there's another wave? I think we should we should expect that there will be another wave. What do we do between now and then to be prepared? And to me, that's hardening the medical system by getting as many hospital staff vaccinated as possible. Uh, B, getting as many high-risk people, high-risk patients vaccinated as possible. And C, getting ready to uh, to be able to respond with treatments like monoclonal antibodies so that we can reduce the severity of disease when that wave comes. Talk about the wave. There's actually a couple of things I want to follow up on, and we're actually going to, um, in just a moment, take a break and take a, a walkthrough that you and Craig Towns from the Reed staff did in the facility that is going to open on Tuesday. But you keep saying that you think there's going to be another wave. Is that a wave that you think is coming out of the holidays, or now that we're at about the 15th of the month, are we past what we would expect to see from that holiday bump? We're a couple of weeks out of out of New yeah, Year's, and it doesn't seem about, to be that bad. About two weeks after New Year's Day, you'd, you'd think that um, the people that contacted that from gatherings on celebrating New Year's would have, within that two-week period, would have developed COVID. Um, you know, there there probably will be another wave, and then a wave after that. That's just the nature of a, an infectious respiratory disease. The wave the wave goes up. We've watched this since last spring. People sequester themselves. Holy smoke! It's really high. We can't gather. Then it falls down. People say, "Well, it's better. I guess I'll go party or whatever they're wanting to do." And then it goes back up again. So it's 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 the whole thing's driven by it. it's behavioral behaviorally driven, um, but when you, you look at these charts of positivity rates, you can see this undulation as we progress along in time. Let's take a break. You mentioned that you're going to be opening a facility um, at the Coleman Center, and, and we've actually been in pretty good shape, I think, here in Wayne County. For a long time, there were a lot of people talking about, I can't find a test, I can't find a test, and obviously at the very beginning it was hard. Then we ended up with the health department site, and then we ended up with a second site here in Wayne County. For the vaccination, health department's got a site open, 
you all are about to, to open another site. So if, in theory, in a few weeks, if we can get some more vaccine in here, if you're looking to get vaccinated, it should be possible. So we're not having, it seems, some of the issues yeah. that other places in the country well, might be having. Wayne County, I think, is doing well compared, to, well, we're, we're in Orange County, but every other, we're one of 19 Orange Counties in a 92 county state, so we're in the upper quartile of, of uh, uh, we're doing well compared to the rest of the state, which is not doing well. The positivity rate for the state is around 16 percent. We're at about 12. That's significantly 4 percent lower. We've had 156 deaths. We've had three deaths this week, so I don't want people to lose sight of the fact that we still have a high level of COVID in our community and people are still dying from this disease. Um, we're seeing about 40 to 60 cases every day. Um, but uh, when you compare yourself to other places, we're, we're probably doing better than, than many. And testing does continue for the health department? Exactly, we'll continue to do testing just like we always have. We, we've, if you come to the Elder Beerman building, if you wanna be tested for COVID, you come in through the west door. If you want to get the COVID vaccination, if you're scheduled to, you come through the south door. So, and we'll be open on Martin Luther King Day, giving vaccinations all day long. Okay. Let's take a walkthrough of the facility that is going to open for getting vaccinated on um, Tuesday. It is a site that is going to be run by Reed Health, um, and let's take a look at that. Good afternoon and welcome to the Reed Health COVID-19 vaccination clinic. I'm Craig Towns and this is Dr. Hughes. We will, Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Plan on giving you a walkthrough of our vaccination clinic and showing you the ins and outs, how patients will flow through the process and uh, answer any questions you might have. So follow us. As you walk into the vaccination clinic, you'll have two different options. If you're registered ahead of time, you'll be able to go to one side if you're unregistered, go to the, the right side if you're, if you're not registered. Um, at that point, once you come through, you'll be able to go to his patient staging area, and at that point, you'll be able to be called back uh, when, it's, when it's your turn. This is gonna be a large mass vaccination clinic, so we'll be able to put through quite a few folks. So it, the lines will move rather quickly. So this is actually gonna be a great advantage to the Reed Health vaccination process. So, All right, so Craig, before we leave here, if I'm not registered, sure. one thing happens. If I am registered, another happens. If I am registered already, yes. I'll come to probably this side, I think you said, the Correct. right side. Yes. And uh, what will be the check-in process? The check-in process basically verifies your name, your date of birth, whom you are, and that'll be simply as, as quick as that. On the left side, if you're unregistered, there'll be a little bit of information that we'll need, insurance information, some, some routine health questions. Once we get that part of the process finished up, then you'll go right in. It's actually, it moves along very quickly, so we've done quite a few of these as of yet, so it's been, we've been improving our process as we've been going. Right, so that process of registering takes a few minutes. Yes. I mean, it's not prolonged, but Correct. then if there's a line of people, that adds up to everyone. And so yep. I think the, the key concept here is, if possible, we should register online before we come in. That's correct. That will make it very quick to get through. Uh, you can be done with the whole thing in a few minutes. That's correct, yes. We do encourage that. I, I do echo Dr. Hughes' uh, suggestion. Register online, fill out that information. That does speed up your process when you come in. So definitely a time saver. All right, if you all are ready, we'll, uh, we'll move through and head on into the, uh, the, the main concourse of the Coleman Center. So once you have registered, whether you're unregistered or registered, once you're all finished up, you'll come through the Coleman Center and you'll actually be staged in a patient staging area, which you see right in the center. From that patient staging area, we have, the two, we have the two vaccine tent sections. We've got a section on our left side of the Coleman Center. We've got a section on the right. There's six total. And as those, are, those individuals are ready, they'll simply call you back from the staging area. You'll go in, receive your vaccine. Again, it's a very easy process. Um, our vaccinators are waiting. These are our experienced uh, RNs and medical assistants and LPNs. They've done several of these as of yet. Uh, so once, that, once you get your, uh, your vaccination, you'll get a, a vaccination sticker 
that can that shows everyone you've been to the Coleman Center, you've got your vaccination, your COVID-19 vaccine, and you'll proceed on to the observation area where we'll watch you for a 15 minute period of time. During that 15 minute period of time, we'll actually schedule your second vaccine at that time. Whatever time and dates convenient for you, with, if we do the Pfizer vaccine for you, it'll be 21 days. If we do Moderna, we're looking at 28 days. So we'll just look forward to either three to four weeks and then schedule your second dose while you're here. So you'll walk out the door with your second appointment. So I would just point out that we've got individual cubicles set up, yes. six of them at the moment, but Correct. there's space for lots more if we ever decide we need that. Yes, sir. And there's, it's private space, so everybody will have their own space to do the little bit of disrobing that needs to be done to be able to take the shot. And so it's, it's enclosed and there's complete privacy. Now yep. the, the shot itself ju just takes hardly any time at all. Yep. I've now been through it twice and it was yep. so fast I could have blinked an eye and missed it almost. Right. And so we'll be, we'll be waiting for an open cubicle in this area, but mm -hmm. then we'll quickly move through this part and probably the, the, the slowest part will be just getting ready to take the shot and Correct. getting dressed again afterwards. Correct. The shot itself is super quick. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I do echo Dr. Hughes' uh, sentiments. Absolutely. The, the shot process is quick. Honestly, it's, it's, you spend more time taking your, your shirt down or your jacket down getting ready and, than as the shot takes. Once you move on to the observation area, the main section here in the center, a lot of folks are, will be asking what that main cubicle section is right in the middle of the Coleman Center. That actually is where we're going to be drawing up your vaccine and getting that to the, to the vaccinators. We'll be having two employees located in this area. We'll be able to move the vaccine along rather quickly. So they'll be basically doing, they'll be prepping the vaccine, drawing it up from the vials, be staging the vaccine. So as the vaccinators are ready from either the left or the right side, they'll come to this section, grab their vaccine. Their patient will be ready, administer their vaccinations, dispose of it properly, and then continue that process on a, on a routine basis. We've actually been able to acquire two, free, two refrigerators here at the Coleman Center. The vaccine will come to us each day. We'll be stored in these refrigerators um, while it's here. And then once, the vac once we're completed for the day, any unused vaccine will be utilized in some way, shape, or form. We'll have a, a potential staging list of folks that if we have extra people to call to come in, if we have any extra doses. But right now we've been running pretty close. Hasn't been a lot of that opportunity, but when, we, that, when that, that has come up, we've been able to bring people in and get those extra doses administered. Let's talk about the, the refrigeration for just a minute, Craig, because a lot of people are aware of sure. some of the refrigeration considerations. These happen to be standard medical refrigerators that are rated for um, storage of standard vaccines mm -hmm. down to maybe zero or a little bit below that, right. zero degrees Fahrenheit. Yep. Um, and of course, they have special temperature monitors, the yep. ability to log the temperatures to ensure that the vaccine is maintained in a safe mm -hmm. manner. Right. Um, but we don't actually intend to store vaccine here overnight. This is really just daytime storage. Correct. Yeah, we and a lot of people are aware that the Pfizer vaccine in particular requires for longer term storage ultra low temperature and that's about minus 70 degrees Celsius. Yes. We don't do that here. We, we have that refrigerator at the main hospital site in our pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And so the process, isn't it Craig, is that uh, the evening before or early that morning of a day, we know how many vaccine administrations we plan to do and the pharmacy staff will take care of the thawing process to get the, the uh, vaccine thawed down to this refrigerator's temperature range mm -hmm. and then it'll be transported here for the day's vaccination needs. That's correct. And then anything that's left over, we will administer to somebody, uh, but if we have to, we can bring it back to the, to the main hospital for storage because the, the vaccines can be maintained for a few days Correct. at that temperature. Yep. So uh, I wanted to point out that these are not ultra low temperature freezers. Correct. We do a lot of uh, Pfizer vaccinations, um, but we have a plan in place for those. Right. Correct. Yeah, we definitely, we, um, obviously the, 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 we, the, no dose will go unutilized. That's the great part about it is, is that we've got a, a large enough network, not only if it's read, read health employees, but also the community as well. Uh, now that we've had the opportunity to expand the giving uh, down to the 70 plus 
and over, there's definitely a wider range of individuals to, to reach out to and maybe bump them up a day or so in the schedule if need be, uh, get them in there if we have any extra doses. But yeah, everything's going really well. So. Good, so this is the storage area. Yeah. Once we, uh, once the, as we go back towards the back part of the beach, which would be the east side of the Coleman Center, this is actually the observation area where patients will come and be observed for a 15 minute period of time. Uh, we, we're, we're actually right now looking to stage anywhere from 40 to 60 people um, any, from the far end of the Coleman Center to that, the, the north to the south end. Um, the great part about it is we'll have individuals back here watching the patients after they've had their vaccine getting their second dose scheduled, which is very important, like I mentioned before, you will walk out of the Coleman Center after you get your vaccine um, with a, a second appointment, which will be great. Um, they'll write that appointment down. Uh, you'll actually also get a reminder within Zotech as well before the day of that appointment. So it's, it's a very convenient system. Um, they will also be admit, you know, watching for any kind of adverse reactions and those kind of things. So Dr. Heath, I don't know if you wanted to maybe discuss some of the things that the observation staff will be looking for at that time. Yeah, mainly we'll be looking for evidence of an acute alert severe reaction, uh, the worst version of which is called anaphylaxis. We've not seen any of that so far <laughs> that I'm aware of. In fact, nobody's really had any significant problems at all um, during one of our vaccinations. But that's what we have to monitor for for 15 minutes. And there are some people with certain allergy history who have to be monitored for 30 minutes. Right. Um, but there are very few people who who uh, have a prior reaction to a coronavirus vaccine who cannot receive another dose. And that's another thing that's a little bit of a different process, but basically we want everybody who has a severe allergy history to discuss the benefits and risks of vaccination with their own doctors before coming to us. Absolutely. So at that point, once the, the 15 minute observation period has come to an end, uh, they will actually you know, do a couple of end questionnaires with the patient, making sure everything is feeling okay, everyone is, is, is good to go. They will actually exit out of the north end of the, of the Coleman Center. That is where the, actually the main parking lot is for the Coleman Center. So very convenient to head out the door where their car will be parked at that time. Um, and then the great part about it, Tons of individuals have been represented within this uh, facility, getting things along, whether it's the, the Wayne County Commissioners to Mr. Kenyon and Dr. Huth working with that group. Um, RPNL with Parallax to engineering. The, li the list is huge of the folks that have made this clinic happen. It's actually been a really phenomenal team effort, and we're very excited to get this uh, clinic going uh, next Tuesday, uh, January 19th. Craig, uh, you mentioned that at this last step, while we're waiting, we're going to be, you know, we'll be giving, uh, setting up the second mm -hmm. shot, but we'll also be giving information about vSafe. Correct. Which is a, 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 a phone-based tracking tool mm -hmm. that the CDC provides that every day checks on your symptoms. Have you had a fever? Have you felt poorly in any way? Okay. And um, that's a good way of additionally monitoring people for possible reactions that may occur later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been doing that. It's a very simple process, takes about 30 seconds to complete. And uh, we'll be giving people information about vSafe as well so that correct. they can get registered for that. That's correct, yes, absolutely. A lot of folks, have, and echoing Dr. Hughes, a lot of folks have found a lot of benefit in the vSafe um, platform. Um, a lot of folks within Reed Health have utilized that platform, uh, including including our, uh, our our CEO Craig Kenyon. He's also utilized it as well. So, very useful tool. Again, like Dr. Hughes said, it doesn't take very long. Um, gives the CDC an opportunity to monitor everything and see how you're doing. If you're already registered, you can be looking at um, with it, with the 15 minute observation time. Uh, again, which during that time frame you schedule your second appointment. You're probably could, uh, realistically saying you're probably going to look in about 20 to 25 minutes. You'll be out the door, so it's a pretty quick process. Um, even if you're unregistered, adding a couple minutes to that. So in less than a half an hour, you've come in, you've gotten your vaccine, you've been monitored, uh, you've included yourself into the VSA platform, and then you're you're on your way. So.
Let me Very just point efficient. out one last thing, which is we've been talking about coming in, whether you're registered or unregistered. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing as walk-ins, right? Correct. Correct. So everybody needs to make an appointment in the, on the, the website that's provided for that purpose. Mm -hmm. The registration part comes in after making the appointment. You, you are sent a link to provide some information that Correct. registers you. You can choose not to do that and just come to the appointment, mm -hmm. but then you'd be unregistered and the appointment will take a bit longer. Correct. Anything that you can do to speed up your time frame through the process with the registration piece, we can't echo that enough. Uh, that is a, has been a tremendous time saver. Uh, as our volumes have picked up, we have really got an opportunity to notice how much time that actually does save with being pre-registered ahead of time. So definitely encourage folks to do that. Well, thanks everybody for being here for this walkthrough with us. Hope you enjoyed it, and we hope we'll see you soon when it's your turn to become vaccinated. Beyond the Church Walls and WCTV has joined together to produce a PSA and to encourage people of color to protect themselves and to protect their families by taking the COVID-19 vaccine shot. Hi, I'm Patty Brown, a retiree of Alcoa here in Richmond, Indiana. I'm willing to take the shot. I am willing to roll up my sleeves and take the shot. Are you willing to take the shot? Welcome back to Ask the Doctors on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11, WCTV Channel 21, streaming on Facebook Live, and also available on TV3 in Connorsville. And thanks to John and his staff for uh, providing this information in Fayette County. Our doctors, Dr. Thomas Huth, Vice President, Medical Affairs at Reed Health, Dr. David Jetmore, Wayne County Health Officer. This is Ask the Doctors. So far, I'm the only one that's gotten a question in today, and that's probably not right. So let's go to uh, your questions for them. Will there be a drive up vaccination site? The reason I'm asking is I cannot walk very far or stand up for very long. Well, I, I, I think that's uh, something that certainly we're considering in the future. I, you know, I think in an instance like this, if uh, we had some that was registered and uh, they were having trouble walking to the vaccination site, we could come out and get them with a wheelchair and wheel them in and vaccinate them and then deliver them back to their car. Um, uh, but we've, we've talked about having a, um, a drive-through vaccination site at some time in the future, but that's, that's, at this point, that's not been implemented. Actually, you know, we're, the limiting factor now is just getting enough vaccine to run the clinic that we have, but hopefully that'll be something that'll come to fruition on down the road. Have you thought about that, Tom? Yeah, we all the time thinking about how can we do that safely and effectively and still provide the high throughput that we're looking for when, when we have lots of vaccine for that purpose. Like you, like the health department's site at Elder Berman, at the Coolman Center, we will have wheelchairs and, and assistance, people who can assist with the, those with mobility issues. The, Probably the biggest problem with providing drive-through is the fact that people have to be monitored for a minimum of 15 minutes after getting the shot. And how do you do that with somebody in the car? Do you have a, you know, 60 cars lined up with people being monitored? How do you keep track of all that? It's a whole lot more efficient to have people come in where into an area where I can have one person helping everybody. Let's keep going. If you are symptomatic, how do you get one of the rapid tests? Where are those done? How do you register? Well, if you're symptomatic, you can have a rapid test down at the uh, Elder Beerman site. Um, you just enter from the, uh, the west entrance. Uh, if anyone who comes in that is symptomatic is eligible to have that rapid test, uh, it takes 15 minutes or less to do that test and we'll do that for you. You don't have to register. You can register online, but if you just come down, we'll, uh, we'll do that test for you. Is that test also being done? Is it available at the Cambridge City site? Do you know? I know you all aren't running that site, but no. you all have conversation with them. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I know we have it at the, um, uh, at the uh, Elder Beerman site. 
uh, I'll have to check with Christine. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, uh, and and at Reed, the Reed um, testing sites, we also have the ability to do the rapid test. Uh, we're using the Bionex cards in some situations, and there's also an Abbott ID machine that's uh, that we have available in a couple of locations. But uh, I would say the difference is with with the Reed. You know, you can't just walk in to get the test. You know, you have to have an appointment and an evaluation. So it's probably a little bit. If it's just a matter of I have a I have cold-like symptoms and I want to get tested. Your, your best bet is probably to go do it with the health department's screening site at the Elder Bearman location because it's it's more amenable to at a low cost and very efficiently go get the test done. Okay, we're going to keep moving. Plenty of questions in. How long after a positive test can one be vaccinated? The answer we usually get to this question is that uh, we prefer to defer vaccination until you're over, you are over the acute illness. And generally that means about 10 days from either the start of symptoms or the first positive test. After that, vaccination is, is according to the current guidelines, just fine. Now there are some nuances um, that um, the state has put out there. One is that somebody who's previously had COVID-19 infection as long as vaccine supplies are limited, maybe that person can choose to delay their own vaccination for 90 days because theoretically they're going to be uh, covered by the antibodies, their own, their natural antibodies from the infection for a while. And that would make the vaccine more available to somebody who, you know, who doesn't have antibodies already. But I never pay, I, I don't really, you know, encourage people to do that just because I think it's better that we get as quick as possible as many people vaccinated and don't get people too wound up in trying to figure out whether they should get vaccinated or not. The key thing is 10 days or so after infection. After that point, it's just fine. The other nuance is that if you have had, uh, if you've had COVID-19 and had the monoclonal antibody treatment, then you should wait 90 days because there's a thought that the vaccination will be more effective if you wait until the, 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 the passive antibodies we've given you wear off. I, I don't know that there's very much science behind that, but those are, that is a situation where we should wait 90 days. Fortunately, very few people have comparatively have had the monoclonal antibody therapy, so that's not a consideration for most folks. And so I would just say for, for the vast majority of people, wait till 10 days after the start of the acute illness, then it's fine. Do you, either of you all have any thoughts, issues, concerns with the assumption that is being made out there that they may release all of the vaccine that they have at some point? You're both talking about, we need more vaccine, we can vaccinate mm -hmm. more people. Knowing that for the Moderna, which is 21 days, 28 days later, Moderna's 28, 28 and, uh, Pfizer's yeah. 21, that there will be those second shots available? Well, I think that's always a concern. Uh, you, you can hedge your bet no, keeping that second dose back, which is what the federal government had been doing. If you, if you release all of those shots, you're, you're betting that the manufacturers, in this case Pfizer and Moderna, can manufacture that second dose in time. And that's, we're talking within a 21 to 28 day period. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume people have consulted with, uh, with those two drug companies. Um, the other thing is, with the, uh, the other thought is, the amount of COVID in the United States is so high, you could almost argue that it would be helpful rather than having those second doses sitting on the shelf to be in, injected because you get 50% immunity, at least in the Pfizer vaccine, after one dose. So that's not a bad vaccine in itself. I mean, the World Health Organization would have accepted, uh, you know, a, a vaccine that was 50% efficacious. Um, obviously, we want that second shot so that they can be 95%. So um, hopefully we won't have people running around 
uh, with just one uh, dose and not able to get that second dose, I think they'll be able to get it. I think whenever you uh, begin, both of these companies will tool up and make many more doses uh, at a faster rate. Yeah, uh, the, I, I think the vaccine makers are gaining more confidence that they're going to be able to fulfill these supply requirements, especially for vaccine and or for Pfizer and Moderna, where they've uh, now got history and kind of know what their processes are, and they they both have uh, plans to expand their manufacturing capabilities. So uh, it's very unlikely that there will be no doses at the time, in my opinion. But beyond that. I feel like I detect a subtle shifting of expectations, expectation setting, let's say, on the part of the federal government and some of the experts. Early on, with it, it was, there was a lot of um, specificity that, oh, you know, if you get Pfizer, you should get your second shot on day 21 or as close to that as humanly possible. And they were saying that because that's the schedule that they used for the studies and they don't have science for anything outside of that parameter, you know, less than or greater than. Mm -hmm. uh, but lately, th they've been talking a little differently. They've been saying, uh, we don't want you to get much earlier than 21 days, but maybe it's okay, it will still be effective if you, if, if you have to wait too longer after that. And to me, uh, whether it's intentional or not, what that sets a different set of expectations is that if there is an interruption in supply and you can't get it at a day 21 or a day 28 in the case of Moderna, don't panic. You'll be okay to get it a week later, two weeks later, a month later. Uh, a lot of people may remember that um, a few weeks ago, about a month ago, the UK decided specifically that in order to make more first dose shots available to people as quickly as possible, they were going to just arbitrarily take and make both Pfizer and Moderna second shot 12 weeks rather than the three weeks and four weeks. And, um, they, and they took a lot of flack at the time, including from U.S.-based authorities. But I think now we're subtly shifting in that direction. You're watching Ask the Doctors on WGTV Channel 11, taking your questions on our Facebook page, also on Twitter, at WCTV Info. Let's go to our next question. Have there been any reports of issues from the first shot? Also, is the second shot different from the first one since people have reported problems? Uh, the first you both had your first and second shots. Yeah, I mean. I, uh, I didn't have any any uh, symptoms other than a sore shoulder, and I think that was the same for Tom. My yeah, son, sure. who's in his early 30s, had after his second shot, which was the Pfizer shot, he had a headache and just felt punky for about 24 hours, yeah. uh, which fits within the parameters of some of the side effects that you would expect. Um, what was the second part of that question? Was there a, was there is also the second, is the second shot, shot different? from the first one. No, it's exactly the same vaccine and exactly the same amount. So yeah. no, it isn't. So, I mean, yes, people can have reactions and uh, these, these, minor, these minor reactions are very common. Some people have more reaction and uh, various places around the country have had to visit emergency rooms and get treatment you know, to be evaluated and so forth and that can happen. That's why we uh, observe people for 15 minutes minimum, just to make sure they're not having a severe acute reaction. If you don't have it within the first 15 minutes, the odds of getting a severe reaction are not zero, but they're much less. So um, it can happen, and you know we can't say that it would never happen to anybody. But uh, like Dr. Jetmore, I I had my my uh, my. The injection site was a little sore for the first day, the first on the first dose, but I, but I had no symptoms otherwise. After that, and with the second shot, I didn't even have the arm soreness. Uh, but we know many people who've had more symptomatology than that. So I I tell people I wish I had had more symptoms so I could kind of you know be the gauge that people compare themselves to uh, more appropriately. But we I think that everybody should expect to get arm soreness, maybe low-grade fever, maybe feel 
fatigued and headache and muscle aches the, for the 24 hours, 24, 36, 48 hours after, the, after either or both shots, you should just expect it. Um, well, I, my experience has been less than that, but mm -hmm. what I wanted to say was um, 9 million, you know, we have to remember over 9 million people have been vaccinated. And uh, you remember we were worried before during the clinical studies that 44,000 people were enough, you know, to, could, in Project uh, Warp Speed. But uh, there's not been any, there was one death reported for, above a physician that had thrombocytopenia and had uh, some bleeding. But it's, it seems that that's not related to the vaccine. So you give 9 million people uh, this vaccine and as few complaints as we've had, I think that uh, tells you what a safe v vaccine it is. You want to mention what your 30-year-old son does so people don't think that you uh, got him cut in line someplace? No, my 30-year-old son lives in Detroit and he uh, got his injection in Detroit and uh, I was just, he just mentioned to me that those were the side effects that he had, but thank you, Eric, for keeping me out of trouble. <laughs> But he's a doctor too. I think he's part like. And he's a physician. Okay. Next question: um, Is the second injection of the two-step COVID vaccine the same solution dosage as the first injection? Which we got a yes. Your program has been very inform informative and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep, absolutely the same. And you, uh, uh, in every respect, in other words, you know, if you had the Pfizer vaccine first time, that's what you will get the second time. Every vial has exactly the same concentration, exact same components, and so, you know, that's what you will get the second time. If you had Moderna the first time, that's what you get the second time. So, you know, yeah, you get the same thing in every way. Okay. We had a question up. Let's go back to it. If cases climb in the next few weeks, will you consider shutting down the county for a short period? Well, it, it, the answer is yes. I think anytime, you know, that's the only tool you have if, if um, cases climb. But then again, you get down to quantitating well, how, how high would that be? You know, we're 4% below uh, the average in the state. We're actually one of the safer counties in the fact that we're orange and not red. So I don't anticipate that happening. I hope it doesn't happen. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately we're going to vaccinate our way out of this. Um, I feel like every person we vaccinate lowers the chance for virus to spread within Wayne County. Um, but I'd have to say, and I would be irresponsible not to, that if it really began to climb dangerously out of control, if the hospital were overwhelmed, if we were running out of ventilators, then yes, you would have to do that. You would be forced to do that. It's, but it's not something you want to do. No, certainly it's not. It's not something you're looking for opportunities to do. And that's not something you would do, I don't even know if you can do it arbitrarily. In other words, it would involve decision making on the part of you know, the local elected leadership and so forth. So this would be much more, it would be a transparent process if we ever got to the point of considering that. And we have to say the things that, at Reed Health in particular were very bad. November, just, I mean, we were looking at mm -hmm. a, a lot of people in and there was no shutdown. You all followed the state guidelines. Mm -hmm. So it, it would have to be, I assume, really pretty bad for you all to take that step. It would have to be out of control, Eric. I mean, you'd be, you know, you'd, and when something gets out of control and you only have one tool, of course you exercise that but it would certainly not be something that I would want to do. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes left in the show. Every week we look at numbers. Things yeah. have been looking better over the last few so. weeks. Hopefully that has given um, the staff at Reed a chance to at least kind of begin to take a breath. Why don't you mm -hmm. talk us through where we are right now? Okay, so there's the county statistics updated with data through yesterday. And you can see that we've, we've come off uh, a high that um, hit around the uh, December the 5th, 12th time frame. And uh, so far this week, through yesterday, there, were, there have been 123 positive, lab positive cases from the county um, uh, data. 
and I am projecting 172 is what we'll finish the week at, plus or minus 12. So basically between about 160 and 184, I think that would be, 185, so call it, to round it. It's been uh, a while since we've been that low. Pardon me? It's been a while since the numbers have been that low. Yes. Um, and, and Eric, uh, you said this week we would follow up on my projection. Last week I said we would, you know, it, we came in at 344. I was projecting somewhere between 340 and 380, so I, I just got in there. <laughs> in and, under the uh, wire. <laughs> hopefully, I think that's he's one for a one. Cocky about his I've, one you know, for one. he's going to give up that doctor thing and I'm become batting, a mathematician. I'm batting a thousand. Um, and that was not a, that was not a guess. That was simple mathematics uh, with applied statistics. And so, hey, that works. You know, at least on the uh, with an n of one. Uh, the next uh, slide there is uh, s sort of uh, a comparison of what we sh what we would be expected to have, just again applying mathematical concepts to what we have had so far since October the first. Since October the first, we on the cases above age seventy, we should have about 165 deaths, but we only have 141. So that is actually you know 141 is too many, but. It's good news, actually, because we are doing better than what the rest of the state is, essentially, in terms of death rates per case, per, per case of COVID. And uh, I like to think that's because, you know, we're better prepared. We're doing more of the right kind of things. We've got a great partnership between the local health system and the, and the county health authorities and so forth. So it's all kind of bearing fruit to some extent. And the last... Um, graph there is just the, the read specific statistics and you see that we've come off a high. We had a little bump. We had a little bump a few a couple of weeks ago that where you could maybe attribute to a post holidays bump. Uh, I don't you know that did not continue apparently. So far this week we're we're on a downward trajectory again and that's the good news. Hopefully that will continue. Uh, but I would say that this pattern actually mirrors kind of what you see in the state level statistics as well, that there was a bump around the from the end of the year to last week, uh, and we're hoping that does not signal a change in direction to be back up. But when you, if you pan back out, Ryan, and you, uh, we can see these three waves that I'm focusing on. We had an early wave uh, in the spring. We have this big wave we've just come off of. The question is, what is that in the middle? And I'm, I make the case that was actually a mini wave. That counts as wave number two. And uh, so we've had three waves. And what this means is that we've never not been in a wave of one sort or another, which leads me to say, based on the history, no reason to expect the history won't continue going forward, we will have another wave. Question is, what can we do now that we're in a relative lull to prepare us, maybe reduce the size of the next wave, reduce the pressure on the hospital resources, and really it boils down to what we've been talking about so f for so long is continuing our um, uh, what are called non-pharmacologic interventions. That is the masking, distancing, hygiene, and then everybody get vaccinated as possible. And um, you know that is what will mitigate things for the next wave. Okay. We've got about five minutes left to go. We're gonna see if we can get at least one more question in. Maybe we'll sneak in too, depending on how long the answers go. What do you got for me, Ryan? Can someone give blood after getting the vaccine? Can it give someone antibodies? You, you can give blood. There's no bar to that. Um, can it give someone antibodies? Well, I can tell you, I mean, I guess theoretically, but more important is whether you will then become, a quali become qualified to be a convalescent plasma donor. And I think uh, there's no bar to that. The, the, as the rules currently are, anybody who tests positive for antibodies can become a convalescent plasma donor. They haven't said you know, whether it matters that you had the infection. I would think you'd rather have people who've been vaccinated because we think that the antibody levels are higher as a result but I don't know. So as it stands now, and I plan to do this myself, get tested for antibodies next week or the week after, and if I'm positive for that, I, and I, I sure hope I am, uh, I'm going to try to become a plasma donor myself. Let's see if we can sneak one more in. Do seniors have to wait 90 days post-positive COVID um, to get vaccinated? 
No. Uh, I kind of answered this question before. Regardless of age, seniors are, would fall into this, my previous comment, that we, the only thing is if you have an actual COVID infection, we want you to wait for 10 days afterwards to get vaccinated. We can get one more in, four minutes. We're going to keep going. We've got the questions. We'll get them in. Um, can people who do not live in Wayne County get the vaccine here? Why? The answer is yes. Uh, the if, if you're in a, if if you live or work in Indiana, you can get vaccinated theoretically at any st state site that is listed, and you know you can basically pick the one you want to go to. Uh, they they do ask you to try to stick close to home or work, but. There's really not a bar to you picking wherever. So uh, the the big the stickier thing comes in people from Ohio that would like to get vaccinated in Indiana because we actually have more access to vaccine than most Ohio residents can get right now. Uh, that's harder because you really kind of need to live or work in Indiana. State rules right now for who you are vaccinating. Uh, well, the first way we, we vaccinated 1A, we vaccinated people who uh, were taking care of COVID patients, frontline healthcare workers, and then 1B were first responders. Then we, the plan for the state was to do 80 and above, then 70 and above, then 60 and above. Um, so Monday we started out with uh, first responders and 80 year olds and above, then the state abruptly said, well, we'll do 70 year olds and above as well. So we're doing 70 and above right now. And then the plan after that is 60 years and older. And then I don't think the state has really, hasn't told us where they're gonna go from there. I know everybody's anxious to get vaccinated. Uh, the more vaccine comes online, and I think it will do, sh do that shortly, the more we'll open this up. But the strategy is, the, the older people are the people that are most likely to end up in the hospital or end up uh, succumbing to the disease. And so uh, the thinking of the state was let's vaccinate these older patients first, people in their 80s and 90s, and then go on down the list. Okay. Dr. Thomas Huth, Huth, Vice President, Medical Affairs, Reed Health. Ah, uh, it's been a long day. Uh, Dr. David Jetmore, Wayne County Health Officer. Gentlemen, once again, as always, thank you very much. Asking you to consider getting the shot, the vaccine. Um, you can do that both locations, whether you're going to the Elder Beerman site for the health department, whether as of Tuesday, you'll be going to the Coleman Center for Reed Health. They're asking you to go online and register first. Walk-ins are not always welcome in this particular case. It's a lot easier, a lot faster if you go to ourshot.in.gov and register for your vaccine. During the daytime, things are a little bit tight, so we might wanna say if you're up in the nine, 10 o'clock range, you might wanna try the site at that time. Also, 211 is the phone number that will allow you to do that. You can also still get COVID testing at the Elder Beerman site, um, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. You can also get testing um, at the Cambridge City site that still continues to be open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Also want to remind you that Dr. Thomas Huth is my guest on In Focus. You can see that program again tonight beginning at uh, 8 p.m. Also tomorrow, 8 a.m. at 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Sunday, 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. That show like this is also available on our Facebook page. Thank you very much for watching this week's Ask the Doctors on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We'll have a special guest for next week's show. As always, I wish you well. Stay safe. This episode of Ask the Doctors has been brought to you by Wayne County Government. 
Hi, I'm Christine Stinson, the Executive Director of the Wayne County Health Department, and I'm here just to let you know that our COVID vaccine center is open and ready to serve you. So however you're receiving your information now, whether it's the radio station, the newspaper, or WCTV, or the Health Department social media page, please stay tuned and stay in touch with them. We'll be posting all of the information that way. Look for the time that we call your target population forward and the registration links will be provided.